Welcome to this edition of Security and Compliance Weekly. In our first segment, we're talking to Steve Schlarman, who's an integrated risk management strategist for our sponsor, RSA Security, specifically RSA Archer. We're going to talk about risk management and resiliency given the perfect storm that is the year 2020. In our second segment, we welcome back David Muntank from the PCI Dream Team and Ivan Sarini, co-founder and CEO of Farut Security. Ivan and David will talk about a white paper they've collaborated on entitled How Backdoors and Client Side of Web Applications Can Lead to Breaches and GRC Compliance Issues. We have a busy show planned for us today, so let's jump into it and join us as we continue our journey of tearing down silos and building bridges on Security and Compliance Weekly. This is a Security Weekly production. And now, it's the show that bridges the requirements of regulations, compliance, and privacy with those of security. Your trusted source for complying with various mandates, building effective programs, and current compliance news. It's time for Security and Compliance Weekly. It's the end of the quarter. You've got a mountain of compliance tasks to complete, daily requests from sales for security documentation, and an upcoming audit. You're waiting on evidence requests, and you can't find the policy you wrote last week. Compliance management is hard. Aptable Comply makes it simple. Comply is an end-to-end, purpose-built GRC platform to manage compliance. From automating evidence collection to integrating with your existing SaaS tools, Comply simplifies the hardest parts of managing compliance. Reduce manual processes and build trust with your customers. Visit securityweekly.com forward slash Aptable to learn more. The question is simple. Have any of the systems on my network been compromised? The answer is harder than it should be. Enter AI Hunter. Active Countermeasures has automated and streamlined techniques used by the best pen testers and threat hunters in the industry to create AI Hunter, a network threat hunting solution that does the first pass of a hunt for you to identify systems that are most likely to be compromised and scores the results on a scale from 0 to 100. You can then research those systems in depth with AI Hunter. Focus your valuable time on the systems that need your expertise with AI Hunter. Sign up for a personal demo today at securityweekly.com forward slash ACM. Cyber risk and compliance automation is finally here. Legacy GRC systems cannot simplify the complex use cases and deliver powerful automation that cyber teams need. CyberSaint's integrated risk management solution ingests data from your existing tech stack, dynamically lighting up controls using patented AI. Leverage your expertise and showcase business value. Let your risk and compliance solution work for you. See why the most forward-thinking CISOs of the Fortune 500 support their teams with CyberSaint. Maximize your cybersecurity program today. Visit securityweekly.com forward slash CyberSaint SCW. Welcome to episode 48 of Security and Compliance Weekly, recorded on October 20th, 2020. That's 10 20 2020 for those of you following along at home. I'm your host, Mr. Jeff Mann. Joining me today are my co-hosts, Josh Marpet, Scott Lyons, and John Snyder. Gentlemen, welcome. Y'all look groovy as usual. Uh, a couple of announcements before we get started. Join Amit Baraket. And I hope I pronounced your name correctly, Amit. He's co-founder and CEO of Perimeter 81. He and Paul Asadorian together are going to do a technical deep dive into the problems inherent in legacy VPN technology. Together, they will explore solutions for the modern workforce and how momentum towards perimeterless security is helping redefine the future of cybersecurity. Register now by visiting securityweekly.com forward slash perimeter81. Also, would you like to have all of your Security Weekly content at your fingertips? Do you want to hear from Sam and Andrea when we have upcoming webcasts and technical trainings? Do you have a question for one of our illustrious hosts, someone from the Security Weekly team, or do you wish you could just hang out with the Security Weekly crew and community? You can do all this and more by subscribing on your favorite podcast catcher, signing up for our mailing list, and joining our Discord server. Stay in the loop on all things Security Weekly. To do this, of course, go to securityweekly.com forward slash subscribe. All right, enough of that. Uh, 
Today, we are joined by Steve Schlarman. Steve Schlarman is an integrated risk management strategist for RSA Archer. He has 20 plus years of experience in IRM, GRC, security and product marketing, and he brings all that to his role at RSA Archer, where he does things like market research, thought leadership, all revolving around the risk management industry. Steve, welcome to the show. Thanks. Happy to be here. (laughs) <laughs> I feel jealous. Uh, everybody's got guitars behind them. Don't they? Uh, <laughs> yeah, I just run out. That just means you're cool. When I saw, that's awesome. We might have to talk guitars at some point. Um, so, uh, Steve, tell us a little bit about yourself, uh, your background, how you got into cybersecurity, and how you ended up where you are today. Yeah, it's been a it's been a long and strange road. Uh, I started about in the mid nineties inspired by the movie that we all love, know and love, Sneakers. Uh, so I started pen testing at one of the big four, Price Waterhouse at the time, uh, back in the mid-90s, um, and kind of worked my way up the food chain into doing more on the strategy side. And along that road, I uh, built a tool called the Enterprise Security Architecture System, which was an, kind of an early GRC a uh, tool that was spun out, bought by a startup. So I did that. And uh, that uh, company was eventually bought by Archer Technologies in 2009. Uh, and have been with Archer ever since. So transitioned a little bit from the security side uh, over into more of the compliance risk. Uh, so the last uh, probably 15 plus years has been more on the risk management side, uh, You know, bringing some of that mentality on from the cyber uh, security side, but, uh, you know, being uh, exposed to risk programs, chief risk officers, and those, those roles as well as I've been uh, working with uh, those types of teams for the last, uh, well, 15 plus years. So. So just to put this in context, you were at, you started off at PW before it was PWC, correct? Correct. Man, you're old. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, I know. I know. I, yeah, look yeah. who's talking. I'm sorry. <laughs> what? <laughs> it's yeah, all we, about we talk Steve about right QSAs. Now. He goes, no, I was a QSA before it was a QSA. Uh, <laughs> uh, PCI, 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 QSA, pre-PCI. So it's a Pop don't worry. Is. What, okay, what were QSAs too. called Back before my day. QSA? <laughs> it was QDSP. Look that one up. Anyway. It's all about Steve. Hey, Steve, we have uh, what we like to call the hot seat question that we want to run past you. And this is an open-ended question. There is no right or wrong answer, but we will make fun of you depending on uh, what you say. Um, <laughs> it's really to get just a, a little bit of a glimpse into your your perspective or your vantage point on this thing that we like to call the security versus compliance continuum. So where do you fall on the security versus compliance continuum? Uh, It's a very interesting question, given I've seen both sides of that equation, um, starting in, you know, with pen testing um, and, you know, being pretty hardcore into the security world, but uh, transitioning over. I was at uh, PwC when SOX came out and uh, we were all sucked into that vacuum um, that really kicked off this massive compliance uh, landscape that we see today. you know, my short answer is um, just because you're compliant doesn't mean you're secure. Just because you're secure doesn't mean you're compliant. And uh, I think they work well together. I see compliance as a springboard for bigger and better things. Um, when you, um, you know, apply controls, you're a big PCI guy. So when you apply PCI controls to the payment card systems, some of those controls are really good. They should be applied to other places um, and not just for compliance purposes. They should be Im- uh, implemented to manage risk. Uh, we made this uh, a point when we went through a lot of the SOX compliance um, back in the day uh, that just because those controls are implemented on financial control systems doesn't mean you shouldn't apply some of those same principles to other systems within your, within your enterprise. Uh, and so I think there's a good symbiotic nature between the two. They're not uh, synonymous. And I think you have to look at each um, and, and how those those bring value to an enterprise. Um, so I don't know if that answers the, the hot seat question, but that's, a, that's my kind of a story and I'm sticking to it. 
No, that's great. I mean, it, it, like I said, it gives us a, a little bit of a glimpse or insight into, you know, kind of where you're coming from. It's, uh, you know, uh, to comfort you a little bit, I, I too started in pen testing and, and drifted over to more of the compliance side of things. Uh, I had sp- two specific reasons for doing it. We can talk about that later. I just think it's funny that you know back in the mid-90s, uh, you, you were a pen tester for one of the big four. All the rest of us wouldn't necessarily have said that that was a, a, a respectable <laughs> way to get your start in pen testing. Uh, we can also talk about that later. Um, but what we want to talk about a little bit today is is what you're doing in terms of uh, you know being a, a thought leader or strategist for risk management. And gosh, what a year it has been in in terms of risk management uh i call it the perfect storm it's like everybody you know everybody's plans or not were were put into effect whether that whether they were ready or not uh any initial uh thoughts or, or you, know, you know what's your take on how this year has played out yeah this year i you know um perfect storm um i think it's been a, a the the biggest curveball thrown to the risk management um community um, you know, pandemics and, and these types of uh, situations are not unknown. Um, and and we, we've seen pandemics before, um, although the nature and the magnitude and the, uh, the ripple effects across all types of, of risk domains has been uh, tremendous this year. Uh, you know, from an RSA Wait. perspective, we've seen massive shifts from getting workers home um, you know, it's for, for remote workforce. So, you know, the identity side of RSA has been very active in helping customers, um, you know, get those uh, advanced authentication, the two-factor authentication in place. On the Archer side, we've seen um, a lot of risk functions, you know, trying to help the business make good decisions. Um, in, in our net witness world uh, at RSA, we've seen the security teams dealing with a lot of the the phishing attacks and the disruption in user behaviors and how security operations teams are dealing with that. So every function has been affected by by this, um, you know, from managing your supply chain risk to your business continuity, disaster recovery people, to uh, your auditors who can't go out and, and do compliance activities because they're on lockdown and they can't go to facilities. Uh, so it's been uh, a, quite a year for organizations trying to keep a, a lid on some of these risks and help the business keep moving forward. Somebody wanted to call party foul and throw a schmoo ball. Was that you, Josh? Oh, well, I mean, I was just curious uh, in terms of pandemics. I mean, we've seen epidemics. We've seen people thinking that a pandemic was going to happen, but I'm curious, where have you seen a pandemic before this one? Well, I, when you use the word pandemic, it, the, the, um, you know, we've had issues before with, with health issues and, and companies generally okay. have the concept of a epidemic or pandemic on their risk radar. Uh, and so they've gone through uh, maybe a tabletop exercise that said, what happens if we have uh, some, you know, uh, effect in the workforce from some illness? Uh, they may have tabletop that. They, they may just uh, have thrown it out. I think the global nature of this, the fact that borders were shutting down, that um, you know, massive workforce shift, um, it, it's just a, it, it's it's on uh, on steroids. So I wouldn't say maybe we've gone through pandemics before, but I mean, okay, you no, know, no. Um, and I wasn't meaning to put you on the defensive, but I wanted to yeah, sort of yeah, get no. the idea across. And by the way, I had to make sure I had a guitar. Okay, so I, I stuck a, a, a flaming guitar up there because apparently you're not cool until you have a guitar in your picture. So anyway, yeah, at least um, I, I, I want to sort of point out that it's not the fact that, oh, we weren't thinking about a pandemic this year. I mean, I, I'll be honest with you. I can't tell you the number of companies I've talked to that had to say we have a pandemic plan and find it, <laughs> dust it off and realize it's in a binder on the shelf of the HR director. And the only reason they still have it is because the HR director never throws anything out. You know, that kind of thing. So uh, my point is, is that in this year where we finally realizing that black swan events are not once in a million years, there seem to be now once every year. I personally have lived through several. Okay, people ask me, well, how do you know about anything about disaster recovery? 
you know, I'm getting old enough now. They actually believe me, but you know, 10 years ago they didn't. And I'm like, well, let's see. I worked in the twin towers. Uh, I was a cop in Louisiana during Katrina and I made it back home up to New Jersey just in time to help my parents and, and sister with Sandy. And they go, yeah. Oh, I'm like, so I've been through this. So black swan events to me happen about every five years, maximum, maximum. Okay. And uh, yeah, that's but normal. That's, that's the world we live in now, but that's the world we live in now. Right. That's like, my it, point. So how does RSA, uh, j thank you, Scott. That's exactly my point. So, yeah. uh, how does RSA work in this new, I, I hate to say this, this new normal of black swan or massive disruptive <laughs> events happening? Let's say every year a few. Yeah. Well, right. I think I, I got think a, a, hold, on, Steve. I, I, hold on, Steve. I have to interrupt real quickly because a fair question was asked on the discord server. Uh, what, mine isn't fair? Points. <laughs> what is the origin of the term black swan? Oh crap. I don't know. Well, you don't get 500 points then. But keep using the term. You don't know what it means. No, I know what Go it ahead, means. Steve. I don't know where it came Continue. from. The etymology is different from the definition. Do not do that. <laughs> you lose your guitar. Uh, let's see here. The Bye. term black swan originates from the Western belief that all swans are white because these were the only ones accounted for. However, in 1697, Dutch explorer William, uh, geez, I'm going to mangle that last name, Vlamgit Smith, uh, discovered black swans in Australia. This was an unexpected event in scientific history and profoundly changed zoology, hence the term black swan. All right, you were saying, Steve. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, was, I was taking notes on that. So um, okay. I think there's a good distinction, though, too, um, between what we've seen this year and... Um, you know, the disasters we've seen in the past. Um, one of the things that we've seen uh, organizations from a supply chain perspective, for instance, is if you have a bunch of suppliers in Florida, um, you understand that there's a hurricane season, you understand that that region may be affected by some type of disaster. Um, but when we, what we saw this year was that the whole globe had these weird uh, lockdowns, you had these, the border closures, you had all of these different effects. And so it put a different spin on things like supply chain risk, um, you know, where natural yeah. disasters are one thing, but this is with something totally different. I think one of the things that your, your, your main question was RSA, you know, I, I kind of talked a little bit about the identity side, the, the net witness, the security side, but in the Archer world, what we're, what we've been seeing is Organizations that had um, a little bit more rigor and discipline around risk management processes were able to track some of the on-the-fly decisions that were being made by the business. Um, and they can go back and revisit some of those decisions because some of them were made strictly, we have to keep the business running. And so we're going to accept, accept some risks in the meantime um, and then we're going to have to go back and unwind some of those decisions uh, as things change. Um, you know, those organizations that are a little less mature on the risk management side were making decisions um, and ended up, you know, trying to track them in a spreadsheet or something where, um, you know, where unwinding those decisions is a bit more difficult. Um, it, yeah, it makes yeah. me wonder. Um... Yeah, I'm kind of thinking cause and effect. Are, are, are effective risk management programs more concerned about the common effects that happen given the various causes? And, you know, we can argue whether, you know, things are significant events or black swan events or not. But, you know, there's things that happen that disrupt operations. Uh, does a good risk management program focus more on what could go wrong or what is the impact to our organization and our business operations, given any number of things that could cause these things to happen? That's a that's a great question, because fundamentally, when you the, the, the easiest equation for risk is likelihood times impact. And um, so what you're talking about is what could go wrong and the likelihood is, is part of the likelihood conversation. Um, mm -hmm. you know, a pandemic could hit, it's a black swan. It's going to happen once every hundred years. So the likelihood of having it, uh, of it happening this year, uh, you know, is X. Um, so that's one part of the conversation. The mm -hmm. second part of the equation is impact. So if that event would happen, 
what is the actual impact to the business? And I think that's where um, bringing the risk mentality or that, that, that risk mindset is really important to talk about the two sides of that equation. Uh, and this mm-hmm. is one of the things that, that I like, um, you know, to talk on the security side because, you know, the security people were, were very comfortable talking about the vulnerability, um, you know, it's CVE XXX and it's, you know, on this server and so forth. And that really affects um, a lot about the likelihood. What is the likelihood of that vulnerability being exploited? Um, but you have to fulfill that, that full equation. What is the impact? What is that server used for? What is the impact of that, that exploit and so forth? So I think that it has to be both sides of that conversation. It's what could happen? What is the likelihood that that's going to happen? And then if that happens, what is the effect um, on the business? And then have that conversation to say, what are we going to do? Are we going to accept that risk? We're going to transfer it. We're going to mitigate it. Um, How are we going to either reduce that likelihood or reduce the impact um, so that risk is in an acceptable level? So the other part of that question is, uh, maybe it's not another part, maybe it's a second question, but, uh, you know, given that I'm, I, I w- I'm reasonably sure that probably the majority of companies out there didn't have on their risk management uh, disaster scenario de- tabletop exercise thing, worldwide pandemic shuts down entire nation states. Um Has what you've been seeing this year been more reflective of, uh, again, sort of in the cause and effect context, companies knew what could go wrong in terms of their business operations, and they're just, you know, instead of seeing three out of 10, they're seeing 15 out of 10, you know, everything that they anticipated has gone wrong, uh, or are there new things that have gone wrong that just weren't anticipated based on this type of black swan event never having really happened before? Seven yeah, seven I think there, it's a mixed bag. It really depends on the organization and um, kind of their, their maturity in the, in the digital space. Um, so, you know, a, a good example is, is a government agency came to us and said, uh, we have 48 hours to empty our buildings. Um, and they had uh, scientists and engineers that were working on mission critical um, projects that, that could not be disru- uh, interrupted. So how do you get uh, all of your, your employees out of your buildings? Um, and, and they came to us, obviously, because of the, the authentication side. So fast tracking and getting software tokens and all of that um, to get the the multi-factor authentication in place. Um, but we've also seen companies who are uh, who are pretty digitally mature in that remote workforce um, perspective. So, you know, it was more about adding bandwidth to VPNs and, and uh, you know, adjusting to, to, the, to the, the, the scale of that remote workforce. Um, a, a really good example of though, I don't want to say it's a positive um, side of this, but um, we had a customer who is a healthcare provider, and uh, because of some loosening of some compliance requirements, they could provide telehealth services to patients in uh, additional states. But part of that process to maintain compliance was they had to get a certification uh, to these physicians through this approval process. Um, they were able to, because they had a fairly mature compliance program already, they were able to implement a process to to get those physicians certified and they onboarded 1,500 physicians in six states. Um, And they just so happened to use Archer as the platform to do that. But that allowed them to maintain services, actually expand some of their services while maintaining compliance. So there were a lot of these these episodes that um, opened up their, the eyes of, of management in, in some cases, like, oh, we can actually have a, you know, a productive remote workforce. We were thinking that this was going to be, you know, a five-year journey, and all of a sudden that just happened seemingly overnight. Um, and then you also had these opportunities to, to expand services and, and really build out something that's going to carry forward, um, like telehealth services for this uh, healthcare company. 
So, uh, John, do you have any uh, legally peppered-oriented uh, uh, questions <laughs> concerning <laughs> concerning risk and fallout from this year? Well, I, I guess uh, I'll just kind of take a little bit broader perspective and say, uh, uh, you know, with the uh, proliferation of black swan events, which I trace back to accelerating technological change, because as our world gets more complex and more inter interdependent, there are just more things that can go wrong. And when things go wrong, they have a longer uh, reach. Um, mm -hmm. And so... Uh, with that in mind, um, I wonder, uh, from a legal perspective, how our legal system can develop the expertise and the subject matter knowledge to deal with these problems as they emerge all at once. It used to be in the law you know, we, we would have a problem and courts would deal with it for 40 or 50 years and, and it wouldn't change. And, you know, we'd come up with some solution to it. And now everything's speeded up. Um, and so uh, I, I guess uh, it's not so much a question as an observation, but uh, uh, I wonder what people think about that, about just the uh, uh, acceleration of, of change and, and, you know, how our society can uh, keep pace with it. Yeah, that's a that is a good point. I mean, the um, one of the things that we we saw um, just to, to piggyback on the on the pace um, is is looking at uh, things like disruption in the supply chain and going through procurement really quickly. Um, you know, being able to assess vendors and um, you know manage risk around uh, suppliers. It's kind of like the legal, they have to go through the contract process and everything. And it's really all about, I think, automation of some of those core processes uh, and providing as much, you know, um, uh, as streamlined as you as you possibly can. But yeah, I think it is a, it is a big challenge for the, the legal and the compliance world as well. You know, it'll be really interesting when uh, compliance regimes start uh, recognizing these black swan events and actually requiring uh, plans for a black swan event, right? I had to get it to 10, uh, into <laughs> what they already require for compliance as it stands. You know, well, yeah, John, can you see, could you see, could you see PCI including something like this? Mr. Jeff? Well, Steve, you started to say something. I'll let you go first. Oh, I, I was just going to say, I mean, we had a, uh, I had an interesting conversation with a CRO who, uh, for a financial services company, who they had a pandemic plan. Um, oh. But uh, he's basically said, if I would have walked in with to the risk committee with the with the uh, the pandemic plan and run a tabletop exercise that reflected actually what happened in 2020 with the global pandemic, uh, borders being shut down, everything, they would have laughed me out of the room and would have said. That never is going to happen uh, around, you know, that magnitude. Um, but he said, now I can go in and actually they're, they listen to me and say, hmm, well, maybe this could happen. So, you know, I don't know if it's a, if it's a positive byproduct, but the op eye opening of, you know, that, that these, some of these events could, could happen beyond the, the natural disaster um, scenarios is, I think, a, um, an interesting point for companies to start taking a look at it's it's almost like there's some cosmic pissing contest going on between you know large superhuman forces on who can develop the worst worst case scenario at least that's my take on it oh, oh PCI. Ahead. i i think i think we ought to add a second uh, hot seat question uh you know the there's the <laughs> continuum question but we should start asking uh our guests whether or not they believe we're living in a simulation a good <laughs> whether they think or whether they're wishing it's a simulation and and who's got the who's got the roll of quarters um 
from a PCI perspective, ironically, PCI, the one thing it doesn't touch touch on as much in terms of classic data security, you know, the CI8 thing is availability. PCI doesn't really talk about availability. They assume that if you're not conducting commerce, if you're not conducting business, at least the data is secure, which is what they primarily care about. So I, I don't know that PCI is going to do much, if anything, in terms of uh, addressing, uh, let's go for 11, black swan events, at least at least in terms of how it impacts just simply the ability to conduct commerce. And we right hit 11. That's, that's number wang. <laughs> right. And that's and and correct me if I'm wrong here, but that's where the lawyers come into play. Right. So how do you how do you enhance and enable commerce? get everybody playing on the same ball field, make sure that everything's quote unquote fair, right? Mm -hmm. In dealing with black swan events. Yeah, let's I mean, go with uh, that. To me, the bigger black swan events in terms of retail and commerce is the, I mean, retail was going downhill anyway as an industry, but now more so than ever, it, you know, I mean, Amazon, frankly, is emerging as a nation state. I mean, they have they have the cloud of probably, I don't know, the 10th or 15th uh, largest nation state Mr. in the world. Mr. Jeff Mann, it's not emerging. They already are. Well, they are. And 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 this this particular pandemic has just accelerated that because, you know, everybody's shopping remotely and where do they go more often than not? It's to Amazon. Not saying it's right or wrong. It's just a comment on that's the way things are. But, you know, if if you've been out at all and driven around your neighborhoods at all, have you noticed how many uh, storefronts are now vacant? How many shops are just, you know, shells of what they used to be? I mean, they're all over the place. And in my neighborhood, which is effectively your neighborhood, Scott, I mean, this this is a new it, this it is, is a new normal that's emerging, uh, which is. which will ind indirectly impact PCI, I suppose. But, you know, people are still using credit cards and debit cards for payments of services. They're just now doing it that much more online, which actually is a is a is a good teaser for the second segment where we're going to be talking about client side uh web application attacks which nobody looks at but uh uh steve let me give you a moment uh because we're winding down here uh, you know any parting thoughts uh you know i'll give you the last word so to speak well well, well i appreciate that um i think what you were just talking about is um a reminder that this this year has uh, uh, poured fuel, uh, gasoline on the digital transformation, whatever you want to call it, within the organizations. It's really Drink. an acknowledgement. The technology has helped us get through some of these pandemics. If you don't have uh, the ability to deliver products and services through some digital means, or if you're um, it, you know, if your digital maturity is less than your competitors, you are probably, um, you know, you need to pick up, pick up the pace. So I think, you know, the, the message out to the risk management, um, and security and compliance, uh, practitioners out there is really, um, the pace is quickening. And, um, when you look at those processes, um, that you have in place to help the business, that's where you need to spend some time to think about how can you streamline those processes and get people, um, you know, thinking about risk, uh, that likelihood and that impact equation that I talked about. And, um, and I think the pace is just going to keep on getting faster and faster. <laughs> Woohoo. Oh, exciting. Yeah. Time. <laughs> Whoopee. Mm. Scott, Josh, you had a comment. I, I did, but the pace is going to be dictated upon like uh, multiple factors from uh, uh, from the speed at which everybody's becoming comfortable with stuff to uh, the speed at which uh, 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 cyber is going to catch up. Right? Like, would would you agree with that? Uh, yeah, I would. I mean, I think the the speed is going to be multiple factors. It's um, you know your internal. Uh, need to optimize your 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 own business operations, your competitive market, um, the geopolitical environment. The you know what happens from a regulatory perspective, given the election that's coming up, and what's you know what comes after, uh, if we ever get back to some whatever semblance of normal is. 
Um, I think there will be, it's always going to be a multivariate, uh, multivariable uh, equation when it comes to, uh, you know, how, how fast your business needs to move. So uh, in the yeah. 70s, I think Pink Floyd had a song called Comfortably Numb. In the 90s, the band Extreme has a song called Comfortably Dumb. Deep. Idiocracy uh, was we, not meant to be a damned documentary, okay? <laughs> it wasn't. But uh, we need to wrap for this segment. Uh, Steve, thank you so much for joining us today. And thanks to RSA Security for being a sponsor of today's show. If you want to learn more about RSA and what they're doing, you can always go to securityweekly.com forward slash RSA security. And uh, please do so because that keeps our sponsors happy and keeps us prevent providing this great content to you uh that's a wrap for us in the first segment uh, we're going to take a quick break come back and talk about risk-based security of client-side applications stay tuned <laughs> 